Good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel this morning. It's glad to see the seats all filled up. Let's pray, all right? Oh, we do want to welcome our guests from Kansas here. You know, Kansas is uh, where Dorothy's from. Yeah. They've been here in the village ministering and uh, blessing the village, blessing all of us. Uh, so thank you guys for coming. Uh, well, you know, it, it's it's a blessing, um, Ryan and Gentry, for them to have you come down. It's just great. So let's pray. Father, again, we just come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, thanking you that you have saved us, that you gave your life up for us. Lord, oh, you are holy, set apart from anyone or anything. And this morning, we just want to worship you in spirit and in truth. We want to bless you and lift you up on our praises. And we know, Lord, as we do that, that our hearts will be open to you and we'll be able to receive what you have for us this morning. So minister to us, Lord. Change us and make us more like you. We pray for this team that is here, Lord. We pray that you bless them, Father, beyond their wildest expectations for them giving up their time and their lives to serve you down here, Lord. Bless them. And so we thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 we got to stand. Okay, ready? Our God. Show them what we can do, okay? Nice and loud. Nice guys. and loud. Here we go. Okay, guys, you guys ready? We gonna show these girls? Do we be loud? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Our God. Get 
You kids did a great job this morning. So high school kids, teenagers, you stay in. And those that are younger, you know, go to your Sunday school classes now quietly. And nicely. Show our visitors how well you can be.
If you want to remain standing, you're welcome to. You can stand before the Lord or you can be seated. It's up to you, okay?
Okay. If you need a Bible to follow along with, Mr. Christian, just raise your hand, he'll get you one. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, I see that we have new friends today. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Thank you. Right. The announcement for this week, this evening, the men meet downstairs, downstairs sorry, at 6.30. Tuesday morning, ladies' Bible study at Kokomo with Miss Jackie. Okay. And in a Tuesday evening, we have the outreach by Miss Burns with Mr. Ryan and Miss Gentry at 6 p.m. Wednesday, of course, we have our midweek worship. You have the ladies' fellowship last week. I get to understand it went well last week. Thank God for that. That continues next month, the first Thursday of the month in December at 6.30 as well. Men retreat coming up, 18th and 19th of November. And of course on Fridays, the youth meet with Mr. Kerwin. Now the Bible reading for this week is about leadership. Since we are talking about leadership, of course we know America is in their midterm election. And the last stat that I checked this morning, in the case of the Senate, we have the Democrats leading by one. And then in the case of the House, Republican, I think, leading by nine or eleven, I think. Now, for us here in Belize, the month of November is special for the Garifuna people. For our visitors, I am a Garifuna person. All right? And St. Mike is a Garifuna community, one of the four or five um, Garifuna community in the country of Belize. Now a little history about us. The Garinago are hybrid, a group of hybrid people. They are a mixture of Arawaks, Carib, and African. That's our mixture right there. All right, originally we were in St. Vincent in the Caribbean, the southern part of the Caribbean. And we were exiled from there by the French roughly in 1796, thereabout. And then we end up in Rotan, Honduras. From Rotan, Honduras, we end up to the main, uh, main land country, Honduras itself. There, our leader, Alejo Benit, moved some of us and migrated to some parts of Guatemala. And then, of course, he ended up in Belize with our ancestors. And so, thereafter, we settled in different parts of Belize, of course, namely St. Bai. And when the Garino came to Belize, there was this man. Thomas Vincent Ramos, all right? Today is a special day set aside for Thomas Vincent Ramos in Belize. He was one of our heroes in Belize, and because of him, we end up, ended up, sorry, with what we call Garifuna Settlement Day that is celebrated annually on the 19th of November. So all Garinago and our visitors, all right, we need to be grateful and we want to give a round of applause to one of our ancestors, Thomas Vincent Ramos. All right, so that is a special day today. Now, the Bible reading is taken from Proverbs chapter 11, verses 14 to 20, and it reads, Where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there is victory. He who is a guarantor for a stranger will surely suffer for it. But he who hates being a guarantor is secure. A gracious woman attains honor, and a ruthless man attains riches. The merciful man does himself good, but the cruel man does himself harm. The wicked earns deceptive wages. But he who sows righteousness gets a true reward. He who is steadfast in righteousness will attain to life. And he who pursues evil will bring about his own death. The perverse in heart are an abomination to the Lord, but the blameless in their walk are his delight. Amen? Amen. Thank you very much, everybody.
Romans chapter, I mean John chapter 13. Romans is on Wednesday night. I forgot what night day it was. I just asked Mr. Delano if he would come to our men's meeting tonight. He usually comes, but I want to make sure he'd come tonight and maybe share more about uh, the Garifuna culture. So men, we're going to have a little special night tonight. Uh, I know that our guests are coming, and so um, I think that'll be special. Sorry, ladies. You guys have your own thing. I know. You know, you guys always have stuff. It's, you, all, you always got stuff. John chapter 13, uh, you know, our guest here, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Calvary Chapels, but Calvary Chapels, what we do is we just teach through the Word, verse by verse, Amen. chapter by chapter, chapter by chapter, the whole Bible, and that way... I don't get stuck on, you know, we don't get stuck on things that we just want to teach on. We have to give the whole counsel of God. So, And we are in John this morning and uh, Romans on Wednesday night. John chapter 13, the Lord's Supper is coming up. But we're only going to look at the first 11 verses. But I heard a story one time. I can't remember which pastor I got it from because uh, I listened to many of them. Uh, but a college student who was in a very hard class. It was a class about birds. So, and it was a tough class. And, and this guy really prided himself because he was a very smart guy in taking this class. He was a very good student. He, he studied very hard. And he was preparing for the final exam. And the professor was a very, very hardcore professor. A hard man. And he studied all night. And he woke up in the morning. He came to class. He didn't see any books. He didn't see any papers. And he looked around, everything was gone except for 25 pictures of birds' feet. <clears throat> and when the class arrived, the professor said, Your final exam is to identify the 25 birds by looking only at their feet. And this young man said, That's impossible. That, that's not right. How can we do that? No one can do that. He says, Well, if you can't do that, then you will get a failing grade. And so the young man says, Well then... I guess I'll get a failing grade. And so the professor looked at him and he said, well, what is your name? And then the young man rolled up his pants, took off his shoes and socks and said, you tell me. <laughs> you know, you can plan and you can prepare, but you never really know until it hits. And Jesus had been preparing his disciples for three years. Preparing them for what was going to happen. And we saw that in the first 12 chapters. And now from chapter 13 to 21, we find that he's going to take them aside and he's no longer going to be ministering to you know the crowds and all the people, but he's going to minister to his disciples in these next chapters. It's their final exam. He's going to leave them to carry on the work. So he concentrates on his disciples, preparing them for what is going to happen. You know, John 16, verse 33 says, <clears throat> These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Nobody wants to hear that. In the world you will have problems. You'll have trials. You'll have tribulations. But he says, he lets them know. He encourages them. I have overcome the world. So, you know, what, what can we do? You know, what can we do? Well, you know what? The answer is in Jesus. How do you get through this life? I mean, what do you do? Well, in John, John chapter 15, says this. Number one, first thing, we can trust in him. We can trust in Jesus. He says in John 15, 33, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you, you may have in me you may have peace in the world, you shall have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. What I just read. We'll trust in him and we'll believe him at his promises that he will overcome the world. And secondly, we will love one another in verse 12 of John 15. He says, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this. That one lay down his life for his friends. None of us can do it alone. We need each other. We need fellowship. Lone Christians, not good. Not good. We need each other. We need to have fellowship. We need to be together. 
You know, we have a, we have a common, we're, we're going to go to heaven together. We're family, so why avoid each other? Look out for the best interest of other people. So we trust in Jesus. We love one another. And then we rely on the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. You know, Jesus said in John 16, 7, he says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And we know that when we believe in Jesus and we receive Jesus in our life and what he's done for us, the Holy Spirit himself comes and lives in our lives and leads us and guides us. The Helper, the Counselor, one who convicts us. The Holy Spirit promises never to leave us nor forsake us. And then we pray. We pray. We rely on the Holy Spirit and then we pray. And you know, in John 17, you know, Jesus gives us the model for prayer. But you know, prayer is simply talking to God. Amen. You know, even, you know, when we sing, we are praying. Thy loving kindness is better than life. I mean, we're speaking to the Lord. We are praying in our songs. Prayer songs. You know, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Paul tells us to pray continually. In other words, stay in constant contact with the Lord. You know, it doesn't mean you're blabbing, blah, 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 blah. You know, if you're working, you're blabbing, you probably get fired. <laughs> Guy's talking to himself all the time over here. People probably think I'm crazy when I go down when I'm in the car alone by myself. Either I'm singing or I'm praying. Stay in contact with the Lord. So these these things will prepare us when the tests and the trials come to trust Jesus, to love one another, to rely on the Holy Spirit and pray. Things we can apply and put in our lives. You know the theme of John's Gospel is really it's. I see it in John. Chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. It says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Believing in Jesus. So the first 12 chapters focus on Jesus' public ministry and uh, especially signs and miracles that Jesus performed and the messages that followed them. And in chapters 13 to 21, now Jesus presents his private ministry with his 12 disciples. This is his farewell message to them. Farewell messages are hard. They're tough. I found that out after 31 years of living in Lake Tahoe and 27 years at the same church that I had to have a farewell message. It was hard to say goodbye to our family, our friends, and, and to come to Belize. It was hard. And I imagine it was hard for Jesus. And so, you know, when you have a farewell message, you want it to be heartfelt. You want it to be meaningful. And so let's read John chapter 13, the first five verses. That was just the intro. You guys hope you're not ready to eat lunch soon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, <clears throat> that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, he got up from the table and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Humility. Jesus. The Father had get put, given everything, everything in His hands, anything. I mean, I mean you know, I mean, that's, that could be a lot of pride. But He took this place of humility. And He's going to wash His disciples' feet.
feet. Jesus and his father, his last days. You know, uh, uh, this last week of him, Monday, he cleansed the temple. Tuesday, he had conflict with the leaders. Wednesday was maybe a day of rest. Thursday, he met in the upper room and the disciples in order to observe the Passover. And his hour had come, which we'd looked at in the last few weeks. The time had come for what he came to the earth for. It was there. It was time. The time that he would be glorified through his resurrection, through his death, his ascension, and he would be he was just going to be glorified. It's here now. You know, we've been looking at it all this time going through this, and it's time. You know, you are immortal until the work is done. They could remember they could not touch Jesus. They couldn't grab him. They couldn't arrest him. All the times they wanted to, and they wanted to kill him, they wanted to stone him. They never could get him because his time had not come. And it's the same way for you and I. That day when we take our last breath, God knows, and He does. He takes us. You know, we I was had the honor and the privilege of yesterday doing a funeral for a godly woman who went to be with Jesus, and you know it, it was really it was. It was a good time. It was a time of celebration, sadness in the hearts of the loved ones, but at the same time knowing where she was at that moment, rejoicing, and possibly while we were singing, you know, at the, at the memorial service, she's probably singing with us. I'm sure when Jesus sat down and he, to wash their feet, to wipe them with a towel, I'm sure the disciples were shocked. What are you doing? What is going on here? The Jewish servants didn't even wash their master's feet, but the Gentile slaves might. But not a Jewish person. They didn't wash feet. You know what? He's giving them a valuable lesson in humility. An unforgettable one. Here, the, once again, the Father had given all things into His hands and He takes the place of humility and washes their feet. He could have sat there and said, put the crown on my head, you know, give me the robe, like, you know, we would. Posh the gym. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake, our sake, he became poor so that through his poverty might become rich. Through his poverty, through his humility, through him giving up his life, we become rich in him. Share a little bit of a testimony. You know, I, we have, it's interesting that we have a mission team here this morning. But years ago, 1998, in 1999, Anna and I took a team to the Philippines. On, we used to do short term mission trips and never wanted to be a full-time missionary that was like way out there that's who wants to do that you're crazy so we did short-term mission trips and we went to the philippines and in the philippines the people there loved us because we were americans i mean they treated us like royalty it was almost embarrassing i i asked him pastor bong he said pastor bong why why, why, why do you like us so much he says because macarthur came back you know, General MacArthur and Woodward, he came back. He said he was going to come back. He came back and set him free. So they treated us like that. And, and to be honest with you, you know, I heard after talking to Pastor Bond that a lot of the mission teams, a lot of them, probably most of them, came and they would put their little thrones up on the stage and they would sit up there and just be served and then do their messages. And, you know, they just, they, they acted like they were royalty. And for some reason, you know, I didn't know that. I, I, we, the things we did, we didn't do because we heard that. We didn't know that. We just heard later. But their mayor and the leaders of their districts were all coming to hear. A, uh, we were have a breakfast together, and I was going to give a message. So I gave a message, this message. And as I gave it, my team came out with uh, buckets and towels and started washing their feet. 
And they were, no, 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 no. They didn't want us to do that. No, you can't do that. You're Americans. You can't do that. Yeah, we're, Jesus did it. We can do it. The mayor wouldn't let us touch his feet. And it was, for them, in their eyes, how could we do that? But you know, we were taking that place of humility and showing them an example of who Jesus was to serve. When we, every time we would go to eat with them, we have uh, meals with them, they always made us go first. And then we decided, no, you go first. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because it's interesting because when we went first, we always took a little bit because we wanted to make sure that, that they had enough. When they went first, they took it all. <laughs> <coughs> Pastor Bong, I hope you're not watching. <laughs> <It was, laughs> huh? <laughs> We had a little bit left, you know. We would set up there. We would come in and set their equipment up for them. When you know when we were going to have our outreaches, you know, and we set and they no, you don't do that, you know. And one time we were at a, this huge outreach they were doing, and we were going to do some music and things, and they had their sound system, and they were having problems with it. And I ran up and I jumped up on the stage. I guess it wasn't kind of cool for I should have went around the steps and looked. <laughs> Like I jump up on the stage, I get to the wires, and I know sound, you know. I, I I know, you know, I was a sound man, I did sound for huge concerts, and I fixed a system for them. And and they were blown away and and the other pastors came to Pastor Bong and, and here's here's what they said to him. And it, it, it just humbles me to even say this. He said, These are real true missionaries. These people are real true missionaries. I mean for us it was like, wow, what an honor. But for us that's what isn't that what you're supposed to do? And to be flexible in humility. That when things don't go right, which I don't know if you've any been on a mission trips, they don't go right. <laughs> and our Pastor Chuck Smith always said, the flexible shall not be broken. If you're stuck, you're going to be broken. You're going to be mad. You're going to be upset. I get upset sometimes. With our kids sometimes. Going, ah! <laughs> but to be flexible. Flow with whatever happens. Take the place of humility. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that's maybe something our team that's here needs to hear. I don't know. God does that, though, you know. He gives us special messages. You told them. You, you don't know. But, you know, those are things that the people in the Philippines would not forget. And the disciples aren't going to forget this. See, we're like the disciples. We're so full of worldly competition. Oh, I, I, I love to play games. I love to win. Matter of fact, you know, when I play games, you know, if you're new to, with me and you're going to play games, I have a disclaimer. I say, by the way, when we play this game, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> I'm playing to win. I, I, I would love, you know, I can't now because I, I can creak. I would love to go on Survivor. But I'll never tell them I was a Christian. Because then you get kicked out. Because you couldn't help it, probably. I mean, you know, I... Pastor here is looking at me like... <laughs> so they're blown away. Well, let's go back and, and read the next verses to 11. In John chapter 13, verse 6. So he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Wash my whole body. I, I added that, okay. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but... It's completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. We'll stop right there. See, as Peter's watching Jesus watch his friend's feet, he became more and more disturbed. And he sticks his foot in his mouth. And what does he try to do? He tries to correct the Lord. Lord, you aren't washing my feet. No way. You're the Lord. You are not going to do that. And Jesus says that you don't let me do this, you have no part. No part with me. Then wash all of me, Lord. 
Peter, you only need your feet washed. The rest of your body is clean. But here's the bigger picture. We are cleansed, you and I, by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. We are cleansed. We are washed with His sin eraser, the blood. We're washed. But we get defiled in the world. And we blow it. And we sin. So we need to be continually washed not the whole body, you know, not, you know, we don't need to be, but to confess those things in our life on a daily basis and let Jesus wash our feet daily. That's the bigger picture. We can learn an important lesson here from Peter. Because, you know, sin will hinder our lives. And if we don't, let, if we don't confess and we don't let the Lord cleanse us, we have no part in Him. That, that's what he's saying here. Don't question the Lord's will or work and don't try to change it. Peter was having a hard time accepting this. He was a hard time accepting what the Lord's ministry was because he probably wasn't ready to minister to others. And when he learned to accept it, guess what? God was going to use him in incredible ways. God knows, Jesus knows what he is doing in your life and through your life. It takes humility and grace to serve others. It takes humility and grace to let others serve us. Sometimes that's even harder to receive. And a lot of times, guess what? Our pride doesn't let us receive. When I was becoming a missionary, the first thing out of my mouth was, well, I'm not begging for money, God. If you're going to make me be a missionary, that's bad enough. But I'm not begging for money. And he slapped me. Well, you know, he didn't really. Spiritually speaking, whap, whap. You, for years, tell people to store your treasure in heaven. And now you don't want to give them an opportunity? Okay. And he humbled me. Because it's, it's humbling to, to receive. Also, as we look at this chapter here in John 13, we see, shows that Peter and Judas were different. Both of them were different. Because both of their feet needed to be washed, but one of them needed a full bath. <laughs> Judas needed a, he needed to be cleansed. You know, some people say that Judas was a saved man who sinned away his salvation, but that's not what Jesus said. He said he needed a full bath. He needed to be, he needed to be born again. He needed to be saved. John 6, 64. It says, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who it was that would betray him. Judas wasn't saved. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be cleansed and to know that you're cleansed and to deepen your relationship with the Lord and your fellowship with others. It's a good thing. It's important, very important, that we're honest with Him and we keep ourselves clean by going to Him and confessing and laying those things down. Maybe on an hourly basis for some of us. Depends what I'm doing. If I'm driving, I have to, I have to confess a lot of sins in, when I'm driving in the States. This morning, we may need a foot washing from Jesus. Or maybe this morning, or those of you who are online this morning, <clears throat> maybe you need a complete body cleansing. Maybe you need to have your sin forgiven. And if you watched before, you know Jesus shed his blood on the cross for our sin, all of it. And we believe that with our whole heart. And he rose from the dead. He's alive. And you believe that with your whole heart. You trust that. And you confess your sin to him. You will be saved. Call, confess him as Lord. And then your whole body will be washed. But there's some of you and some of us here that maybe need the foot washing. Maybe, you know, there's some things we need to confess in our lives this morning. And be made right with the Lord. You know, I don't know. But if you're like me, I usually need a little washing. 
If you go barefoot around here in Belize, you need your feet washed, don't you? Actually, you wear sandals, you need them washed. So I just encourage you, as we close in prayer, let the Lord search your heart this morning. And whatever he shows you, you know, just ask him, Lord, what separates me from you? Is there any sin in my life? Is there anything that I need you to cleanse this morning, to wash my feet? And then as you pray that, if it pops in your mind, don't ignore it. Not that one. Go to the next one. <laughs> Confess it and ask him to help you. Help maybe something you've done to help you not do it again. Help, help, help you to walk in the Lord. And then walk out this door this morning brand new. A new creation. New creation in Christ. For the old things have passed away. Makes all things new. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the washing of the feet, Lord. But most of all, thank you for the cleansing of the sin in our lives by your blood. Search our hearts now, Lord. If there's anything, Father, we need to confess to you, we want to confess it right now. I'll just, just take a moment now, just you and the Lord. Father, we thank you. And Jesus, we thank you that you have forgiven us. We receive that forgiveness right now. And Lord, we ask now that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit and use us to share the good news with our neighbors, our family, our friends, those we work with, we play with, where we go, Lord, so they can join us in your kingdom in eternity. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's stand and sing my favorite song. Those of you who don't know what it is, you'll know in a minute. I love you, Lord, and I